Thanks, Mike, uh, uh, for the invitation, finally, to Duke. Uh, I actually invited myself about a year ago, and we had set a date, and then at the sort of last minute, Mike says, um, it turns out I didn't check the calendar. It was fall break at Duke, and there was no classes, so we had to cancel that, but I'm glad we finally got here. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Economic Freedom Index. This is a project that I've been involved in, well, since I was your age. I, I got involved in this. Um, in 1989. I, I, I date most of my life events around births, deaths, and Bengals losses. And 1989 was one of the Bengals Super Bowl losses. So um, before I tell you about all the numbers and graphs and what the index is all about, I want to motivate the story a little bit with uh, these two characters here. And these two, two fellows, are, of course, are well known in this, in this room, I expect. Uh, on the one hand, we have my hero, Adam Smith, um, because the Super Bowl was last night and tomorrow, today represents, in my opinion, the first day of baseball season. I wear my baseball tie, but usually I'm wearing an Adam Smith tie. I'm an Adam Smith guy. Um, I think I have five Adam Smith ties. I have lapel pins and I think I have Adam Smith cufflinks. I'm an Adam Smith fanboy. And, uh, and I was a, a young uh, student at Ohio University and I was uh, wearing Adam Smith ties then, so 30 years ago. And uh, I think most of you know what Adam Smith wrote about in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, he advocated for what he called a system of natural liberty. That's a phrase that I really like. I wish we would bring that phrase back. It's far better than the phrases we're using today, like capitalism or laissez-faire. System of natural liberty. And what you all, I think most of us again know what that means. It means a system of private property, a system of freedom of trade, a, f a system of limited role for government. Uh, that ball of ideas that we would today call cla classical liberalism or laissez-faire or free enterprise or something like that. And Smith had argued in his day that that system would work pretty well. He was no utopian. He didn't think we would ever have perfection on earth, but he thought that system of natural liberty would deliver the goods, the wealth of the nation would be higher and so forth and so on. A few generations afterwards, you all know Marx came along and Marx said Smith and these classical economists like Smith, uh, they're crazy, they're wrong. In fact, according to Marx, uh, capitalism, which was his term, his preferred term, of course, is going to be a bad system for most people. It's going to have all sorts of, there's like a laundry list of complaints the Marxists have about the operation of a, of a system of natural liberty or a system of capitalism. It'll be have unemployment, business cycles, uh, exploitation of the poor. In fact, according to Marx, the system of, of natural liberty that Smith and the classical economists advocated was going to be so horrific for so many people that eventually they would violently rise up and overthrow their, their supposed capitalist overlords. So what we have here is, are the two greatest figures in the history of economic ideas, at least in my opinion, and they have a very different worldview. One guy says, hey, free market capitalism works. It delivers the goods. We should have more of this. And the other guy says, no, free market capitalism will be terrible. And in fact, it, it will be, it'll be devastating for the vast majority of people who live under it. Now, so these guys can't be right. And uh, the arguments that we've been having with each other, or both of these people can't be, right? The arguments we've been having about uh, free markets on the one hand and uh, good or bad on the other hand, a lot of it's been like these people here. This is my, my, my remembrance of my college days when I was at Ohio U in Athens, Ohio. It's a hippie school, still is. Um, most of my friends were, I was at Adam Smith wearing a tie guy. I was not like the rest of them, but they were all, my friends were hippies. Um, many of them were communists, and I mean that literally, uh, at least in the sense that they would wear red armbands and walk through campus on May Day with pictures of Mao. Uh, so when I say they were communists, I mean literally they were communists, okay? And so um, uh, we would have debates, uh, you know, Ohio is also a party school, so we'd be drinking, and we'd uh, argue, and I would say something crazy like we should, you know, have free trade, and they said, no, we should need to protect the poor from, you know, the vicissitudes of global capitalism or something. And then they would say, we need to raise taxes. And I would say, no, we need to lower taxes. And we drink a beer. And by the end of the evening, I'm calling them commie pinkos. And they're calling me capitalist pigs. And those are my fondest memories of college, uh, those evenings uh, where we argued uh, these ideas. But you know, at the end of my, my years at Ohio U, not a, not a single one of my friends uh, you know, saw the light and came over to my side. And I didn't exactly. There was a lot, of, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of finger pointing. It was like Facebook before we had Facebook. Um, and I'd like to contrast that experience, which I think is what goes on in most discussions of politics and economics, is a lot of people saying is, is not, is to, and pointing names and calling each other names. The contrast with these fellows over here is this is a little clip art I pulled off the internet, a couple of wide lab, white lab coat guys in a chemistry lab. 
And like a lot of economists, I'm a frustrated physicist. If I had about 10 more IQ points, I probably would have stayed in physics. And I'd be an astrophysicist today and be giving a lecture about the, the Higgs boson. I guess that's actually particle physics. Anyway, you get the point. I would be a physicist today if I was a little smarter. Um, and, but you know, and I, and I, I kind of have physics envy. And I do go at SMU. We have a very nice, a very good physics department. I go to their seminars. And I sit in back and I sheepishly pretend to understand what they're talking about. But uh, I notice they argue with each other there too. Especially the astrophysics fellows. I don't know what's, what it is about the astrophysics group at our school anyway. They argue a lot. And um, at the end of the day though, how do physicists settle their arguments? What do they do? Gather data? Yeah. Like the scientific method, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. We, this little scientific method thing we teach in eighth grade. Well, they gather data, they have iPods, but it's actually what they do. They, they, they design a better telescope, they gather better data. If it's experimental, like the, like the CERN Switzerland thing where they, you know, like smash, smash protons together, um, they will, uh, you know, design an experiment and gather data from the experiment. They gather data, they look at the evidence from, that da from their experiment or from their observations, they compare the uh, evidence that they gather with what their theories are and rinse and repeat and slowly but surely we discard the ideas that we don't, they don't think are consistent with the reality we observe and we keep the ideas that are consistent with the reality we observe and we are now, all of us, are the beneficiaries of a few hundred years of that scientific method going on. And we're all living a great, relatively good ex ex existence because of this. I would like to make economics more like those guys and less like these guys. But to do that, you need to gather data, just like physicists need to gather data to settle their disputes. Economists need to gather data to do that here. So I'm gonna do, I want to gather data about this Smith versus Marx idea. Uh, I want to gather data and create an index of economic freedom. And that's what I began to do with my, my senior co-author, Jim Gortney, my teacher. Uh, we set out in 1989 to create an index of economic freedom and try to put a number on how economically free a country would be. And countries will be our, our unit of analysis because that's the, that's the level at which most economic policy is made. Uh, now, it seems like it'd be hard to measure something like freedom. It's a kind of fuzzy concept. Um, but, you know, we measure fuzzy concepts all the time in our lives. We measure who the best college football team is. And we never, and, no, and we don't agree, even after they played the game, that Alabama, was usually Alabama, right? Um, or Clemson, or in the good years, it's Florida State. But anyway, we, we will argue about whether they got the right. Was that playoff the right system? Did that playoff give us the best, was that the best measurement of who the best team is? So even after we divide, design a measurement of a fuzzy thing, like who the best football team is, we'll argue about whether it's the good one or you know, the right way. We measure gross domestic product. That's a pretty fuzzy concept too. Seems very straight, very mathematical. It's the dollar value of all the new final goods and services produced in the country. But if you've ever had a course in economics and studied GDP, you know actually there's a lot of fuzziness and a lot of uncertainty about that measurement. And no one thinks we get it right. Does anyone think the Department of Commerce nails exactly to the penny the, the dollar value of the, of the gross domestic product? No, we all know it's a wrong measure. When you teach the class on GDP, you spend half the class talking about all the problems with GDP. So we know it's a flawed measure. So going into this index of economic freedom, I set out with the knowledge that, hey, every measurement's flawed. We're going to try anyway. And at the end of the day, hopefully we'll have learned something by trying to measure economic freedom. So uh, just like we think we learned something when we measure GDP. Okay, so we want to try to put a number on economic freedom. Uh, let me, I, I, it's, a, it's, it's evolved into quite an inc incredibly large data exercise. Uh, the current version of the index has 162 countries. I have 42 variables and we have data back to 1970. So my spreadsheet is now so large that I, I can no longer email it. Most email systems will not allow you to email it. You have to Dropbox it to, to each other and things like that. It's a very large data collection exercise and I'm not gonna bore you for very long and I can't go through all of the little bits and pieces in, the, in this index. But let me give you a flavor for the kinds of variables and why, and why we selected the variables we selected in just a few of, the, few of the areas. Now the index itself is broken into five areas. So that's the best way to look at this. So size of government, property rights, sound money, monetary systems, freedom, international trade and regulation. So uh, first area, size of government. This is the fiscal area. This is, each of these is worth 20% of the index. Um, this is the fiscal, fiscal policy area. How big is the government in a physical sense? Um, in, in a fiscal sense. The, uh, Adam Smith wrote a, a chapter in The Wealth of Nations, you may have read it about public finance, and he outlined in that chapter what he thought 
the government should do. It's a very short chapter because Adam Smith was a pretty small government guy. If you've read that chapter, the list is basically national defense to keep the French away, uh, police to stop the bar fights in Edinburgh, uh, judges to settle disputes when people can't agree who owns which cow, maybe some roads and bridges, maybe some schools, and then the chapter's over. So national defense, police courts, administration of justice, <laughs> roads and bridges, what we would maybe call infrastructure, public goods. He had a pretty good understanding of what we call public goods today. Um, and some schools, although he had some quibbles about schooling because his education in Oxford was terrible, he thought. So, but anyway, that's Adam Smith. Now, if you compare Adam Smith's size of government, the, the role of government that Adam Smith describes in The Wealth of Nations, with the governments you and I have, or if you're a libertarian like this young man is here, um, uh, we, we, we suffer under, then um, uh, it's, the governments we have are vastly larger than the government outlined by Adam Smith. Orders of magnitude larger, in fact. Uh, the city of Dallas, where I live, we own and operate a hotel. The Omni Hotel is owned by the taxpayers, and, and I'm, I feel like they should let me stay there for free. I mean, I own the place, right? But anyway, they don't. So, so we, we own and operate, you know, owning and operating hotels, rec centers, old age pensions, all of, the, all of the things, the big things that governments do today were not at Adam Smith's list. Adam Smith makes Ron Paul look like a communist in comparison, all right? Uh, so, um, so in this area, I just gather data from the IMF and the World Bank on how big the government is. And we have good data from almost every country on the size of government in a fiscal sense, how much they tax and spend. And countries that have um, bigger governments get lower scores because this is sort of an index of what Adam Smith wanted the world to look like. And bigger government is not what Adam Smith wanted to look like, so smaller governments get better scores, bigger governments get worse scores. I'll show you some of the scores in a little bit, but the second area is property rights. Um, now, um, this is a, a, a pretty hard thing to measure. This is the fuzziest of all the S aspects of the index. We're trying to measure the security of property rights. It's a bedrock principle of any system of, of free markets or capitalism is people own what own their assets, they own themselves, they own the land, their, their buildings, and so forth. Uh, trying to get at the security of that is, is pretty difficult. Let me give you an example of one of the variables we use. Suppose I'll pick on Bruce. Uh, suppose I give Bruce five dollars to wash my car. But bro, I didn't know, you all knew this already, but Bruce, it turns out, is a flake, and he takes my $5 and runs off to the pub and drinks a beer and doesn't wash my car. Now, at this point, Bruce is more or less a thief. If you take money from someone in exchange for a contractual promise to do something and then don't do that thing, you're not that different than a mugger who simply comes up to someone in the street and steals $5 from them. So he's, a, he's in contract violation now. So I take uh, Bruce to court here in North Carolina. Is this North Carolina? Not the I can't remember. Uh, and 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 how the World Bank actually estimates for every country in the world how long it'll take to settle a simple contract dispute. Now I would never sue anyone over five dollars, but suppose it was five hundred or five thousand dollars, and I sue someone for that. How long does the World Bank do you think it say what it'll take to settle that dispute in the United States? How many months or years, decades, weeks? In the United States. In the United States. Three months. Three months. No, that's not that good. They say. They say one year. They say one year. Uh, they actually have a model case, and I, I forget the exact specifics of the case. It's, uh, it's probably several thousand dollars. It's a reasonable contract dispute, although the facts are not really in dispute. It's just that I, I, you, I gave you money, you didn't do the job. How long do they estimate it takes to do that? They say one year. There are some countries where it's six months. There are some countries where it's six years. So we're, we're actually in the better end of that scale. Not too bad, not too, too good either, but not too bad. So that's the kind of thing. So countries where, you're, where it takes six months to settle that dispute, where is my $5 more secure? Well, it's more secure in the place where the judge will get my money back to me in six months than in, in a place where it takes six years. In fact, if it takes six years, I'll probably not even bother to sue you. I'll just maybe hire some thugs to come down and get my money back from you the, the old-fashioned way. So that's the kind of thing we have. Um, uh, the third area is sound money. This is another way in which your, your money can be taken. So area one, in a sense, is the tax man taking your money. Area two is Bruce, the contract violator, taking your, taking your property. And the third one is inflation, taking your property. And here's, here's the story. This is a moderately true story. Um, uh, that is to say, I, I, most of this is true. This may be a mo moment it's not. So my father, uh, when I turned 16, uh, this is the true part. He I had just got my driver's license, and he pulled me aside, and he said, you should get a uh, $100 uh, 
Notice my cheap dad didn't give me $100. He said, you should get $100. I'm like, I'm 16, dad. Thanks for the advice. But I got, so I got it, and you should fold it up. As many times as you can fold up uh, the, the dollar and sl slide it into some recessed corner of your wallet. And this is, you know, this is 1986 or something. There's no, there's no cell phones. There's, I didn't have a Visa card. So this was, and I drove a Volkswagen Beetle then, as I do today. Um, and the one I have today is way nicer than the one I had then. But anyway, the, uh, the, this was the money I would use if the car broke down, I needed to tow, needed to pay someone to fix it, to bribe a cop or whatever, whatever, or whatever. So uh, a year goes by, I forget about the hundred hours, and I find my, you, you clean out your wallet and you find it. That's always fun when you find some money you've squirreled away. Um, what's the problem when I take that hundred hour to the store a year later? We all know what the problem is, right? It's, it's not as worth as much. It's not gonna buy as much. If inflation has five, if inflation has been five percent this past year, that hundred dollar bill is only going to buy ninety five percent as much stuff as it bought the year before. Uh, it's almost like someone took five dollars out of my wallet. Now they didn't. Literally, it's the same hundred dollar bill that I put in my my wallet the year earlier. But it's like that five dollars got taken out of it. It's like an it's like a tax. In fact, monetary and financial economists describe inflation acting as a tax on any asset that's denominated in nominal currency terms. So dollars, of course, are nominal currency, but so are bonds and insurance policies, long-term leases, and so forth. So lots of assets that we have that are denominated in dollar terms are at risk of an inflation tax. Uh, so we, we have in this area, the third area, we have measures of, you guessed it, inflation. We have a few other things in there, uh, but that's basically what it's all about, is how secure is your financial asset uh, to, to not being, being taken from you because of the monetary system that the government is in charge of. And in de facto, every country in the world, the government is in charge of that. The third area, or four, excuse me, fourth area is the area that we, I think, most closely identify with Smith. If you think of Smith for one topic today, it's you think of Smith as being a free trader. Um, he had the audacity to argue in 18th century Britain that, that, the, that the British should trade freely with the French. This was a crazy argument in his day. Uh, the British and the French, of course, have been enemies, bitter military enemies for hundreds of years. Uh, and the idea that we should trade freely with them, we should give them, our, we should sell them our grain and we'll buy their wine, the idea was absolutely absurd. Uh, and it took a long, long time for that idea to get any traction, but he, he argued that in the Wealth of Nations. And so in this area, we measure things like uh, tariffs and quotas. We measure tariff data straightforward from the World Trade Organization. Uh, the average level of the tariffs. We also measure the standard deviation of the tariffs, get at how kind of wild they go. Um, one of the really cool things they estimate now at the World Bank, they, they estimate how long it takes to get a container through the port for the customs process. Uh, in some places you can get a container off the ship and through the customs and into the country in a matter of days, in other places it's a matter of months. And, and that acts like a tax on those imported goods. Um, so that's free trade. In countries that have lower taxes, lower tariffs and, and lower non-tariff barriers, they get better scores. And then the last area is regulation. And this is um, kind of a hodgepodge. Regula regulations are very difficult to measure. At a, again, I'm dealing with 162 countries. So in regulations tend to be very idiosyncratic. Like one country has it, but no other country. So it's very hard to score countries on regulations when the regulations themselves are so different. So the regulations we do measure are usually the ones that most countries will have, like minimum wages and things of that sort. So we have one, one of the areas is the labor market area, I mentioned minimum wages, but they also measure, for example, uh, also from the World Bank, how, um, how, how severe like, uh, labor market regulations are, like in severance pay, for example. So if you're uh, working at Starbucks here in the United States and you, you're not good at your job uh, and you get fired, how much money does Starbucks have to give you? Nothing, actually. We have no law in the United States. You may have a, unless you have a contract specifying otherwise, there is no legal requirement in the United States in our labor markets for an employer who fires an employee to give that employee any, any money when they, when they fire them. But in many countries, not all, but many countries, particularly in Europe, um, there are s fairly severe s severance requirements that when you are severed from your job, when you're fired, you have to be given you know, six months or sometimes a year or more pay. Um, and that's a regulation that acts like a tax, essentially, on the employer. And so we, we measure, we, we include that. Um, how many days it takes to start a business? Also from the World Bank, uh, they measure how many days it takes to start a business. They actually have a, a warehouse that they, they it's, a, it's a hypothetical. They don't actually start the business in 160 countries, but they, they, they go through the thought experiment. Okay, we want to create a warehouse. It's so many thousand square feet. 
It's in the city, central business district of the main city. Uh, how many days will it take for us to go through the bureaucratic red tape? How many offices will we have to visit? How many procedures will we have to go through? In the United States, they estimate that it's like two procedures in 30 days, which is probably about right. Uh, actually, in here, it'd probably be even faster. I think they use New York and Los Angeles as their case study cities for, for that study, so it'd probably be better here, and, and certainly in Dallas. Uh, but that's not very long, 30 days and a couple, a couple trips to the county courthouse, 30 days of delays, and you're in business. Not that bad. It's gotten better, but a few years ago, when they first started doing this measurement, in Egypt, in Cairo, the number was 3,000 days. And I think 42 procedures, 42 procedures, 42 distinct government steps that they estimated you had to do in Cairo, and 3,000 days is the length of time they estimated that it would take if you were going to legally start a business. That's something like eight years. Uh, how many people are going to start a warehouse, or who want to start a warehouse, are going to spend eight years of their lives standing in lines in Cairo? No one, right? So if you're going to start a business in Cairo, you're going to do it illegally without the paperwork, or you're going to bribe your way through that process to make it faster or you're gonna to move to New York and drive Ubers or something. Right? Um, so, so those, again, these are the things we put into the index. So that's just sort of a, a broad sort of framework. So we're gonna put numbers in for taxes, property rights, uh, inflation and monetary stability, um, things like tariffs and trade and then different types of regulations. Um, all these numbers that come in from the World Bank and the IMF, uh, we get numbers from PricewaterhouseCoopers. They get a lot of numbers from the World Economic Forum also, the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, the private group. And I put all these numbers, they all come to us in different forms. I use an advanced branch of mathematics called arithmetic, and they all get turned to zeros to tens. Okay, so 10 means more or less Adam Smith, zero means, I don't think it necessarily means Karl Marx, but it means the opposite of what Adam Smith wanted. Um, so uh, I already screwed that up. I was gonna ask who number one is. Well, number one is Hong Kong. Um, some people are like, hey, Hong Kong's not a country. Okay, yeah, all right, all right. They have their own GDP, their own monetary system, they have their own more or less uh, elected uh, leader. Uh, it's, functionally speaking, a country. I know it's part of China now. Um, Hong Kong has been number one on our index every year since we've been doing the index. And we have data back to 1970 for Hong Kong, and it's always been number one. It's always been around a nine out of 10 on our scale. It's certainly not an Adam Smith or a Murray Rothbard uh, you know, level of per perfect capitalism but it's as good as anywhere uh, we can measure is, is on this earth. Um, I didn't really need to do this index to know this. Um, if you know anything about Hong Kong, uh, you probably knew this anyway. So the top tax rate in Hong Kong is 15%. That's the top income tax rate. If you're a billionaire in Hong Kong, you pay 15. What are we talking about now, 70 people wanna to go to, 15 is the top rate in, in Hong Kong. Um, it, uh, there are no property right problems. In fact, they have one of the greatest court systems in the world. Uh, a lot of commercial contracts are, uh, from mainland China are settled in Hong Kong because the courts are so, so efficient. There's no inflation problems. There are no tariffs or quotas into or out of Hong Kong. Uh, it's complete, absolute free trade. It is actually what Adam Smith advocated. And it takes 30 days to start a business in the United States. It takes one day, according to the World Bank, to start that same business in Hong Kong. So Hong Kong was, is number one, it's not even a close call. If this index, if I'd put all these numbers in the computer and any other country had come out first except Hong Kong, we would have known we had botched the whole project. So thankfully Hong Kong is number one, we knew that was gonna be the case. Singapore is number two, and more or less everything you, I said about Hong, Hong Kong is true of Singapore, but it does, both of these countries do highlight an, an important aspect of our project. This is not an economic, this is an economic freedom index. This is not an, an index of political liberties or civil liberties. Um, neither of these countries are perfectly good examples, especially Singapore, um, of, of, of political liberalism. Um, we, um, I like political liberalism. I, I think I'm using some of my political liberalism right now by giving this talk. Um, I like civil liberties. This index though, and there are other indexes of political rights and civil liberties. And so when we started this project, the gap that we saw was no one was trying to measure the economic aspects, the more mundane aspect of freedom. Can I start a business? Can I hire a worker? Can I import this product? These kinds of freedoms were not given, were being given the attention that we were giving to things like freedom of speech, freedom to vote, freedom to uh, speak your mind and, and worship the God of your choice and the man of your choosing and so forth. So Hong Kong and Singapore are really a little bit weird because they're great examples, as good as, good as we found on Earth, of economic freedom, but they're not the best examples, especially Singapore, not the best examples of political freedom or civil liberties. 
More on that perhaps a little bit later, but that's uh, most of the rest of the countries that score pretty well on the index. They're also our, pretty much our liberal democracies, though. We're looking at uh, Switzerland, New Zealand, Ireland, the United States. You know, you skip over the next two weird ones, United Kingdom, Australia. These are countries that are both market economies. I don't know if we want to use the word free market economies, but they're free-ish market economies. And they're also good, sound, liberal democracies with freedom of speech and religion. And, and nothing's perfect in this world, but they're all pretty good examples of that. Uh, Georgia's the one weirdo. Uh, it's a former Soviet Republic, as you know. Um, and it has risen in the ranks all the way up into the top 10. And uh, I'm a big fan of Georgia. I've been there at least 15 times. I've kind of lost track. Uh, I was there when the Russians invaded uh, in 08, August of 08. Uh, and Mauritius is a little island, a little trading island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, mostly populated by, by South Asians, but uh, technically part of Africa. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so, but most of the, mostly there's a correlation. Most of the countries that are economically liberal are also politically liberal, but it's not a perfect correlation by any means, as you can see with Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, you know, these are all countries that are very at the top. Now, if you look at the next chart here, this is a, a, a selected group of, of the rest of, the, of some of the other countries. These are mostly the larger and more significant countries in the world. Um, the colors are, indica are indicating quarters. So if it's blue, that means it's in the top 25%. And green is the next 25%. Yellow means you're in the third quarter. And uh, red is, I had to use red for the bottom quarter, right? I mean, I had to do that. Way. So, um, so you can see when you think about... If you, th if you were sort of in your head thinking, okay, where are the most market-oriented countries and then order them from most market to least market, uh, I think this ordering more or less is, is about right. Um, the United States, uh, Chile is the highest rated Latin American country, and, is, and it, I think that's probably accurate. Then you get into Germany, but then you get into the social welfare, a little bit bigger governments, a little bit more regulations. So we're going to get into that green area, and this is your Italy's and your France's and so forth. Um, the yellows are going to be countries that are kind of, uh, it's the turkeys. It's like it's a market economy, but man, it's, it's kind of government all over the place and corrupt. Russia, India, China. China is a tough country because if I was giving a number to Shenzhen, it would get a nine. Uh, but I don't give a number to just one part of China. I give a number for all of China. All of China in our index is a 6.4. It's 108th out of 162. It's not very good. It's not a, we don't, I don't, I think it'd be inaccurate to call China as a whole, a free market country, uh, although I would call Shenzhen a free market city. So, so, so China is this weird thing. I mean, there is, there is about as much variation in economic freedom inside of China as there is in the whole world. Um, the last country we score is Venezuela. They're 2.88. I believe 2.88 is the lowest score on the economic freedom index ever recorded by any country ever. Even like Zimbabwe, I don't think, got down that low uh, 10 or 15 years ago when it was in its bottom. Uh, we don't rate North Korea. We don't rate Cuba. We don't rate a handful of other countries. And why do you suspect we don't rate them? You probably know the answer. Data, yeah. This is a completely data-driven index. Uh, Jim Gortney is a, from Kansas. He went to a one-room schoolhouse. I'm from the west side of Cincinnati. He went to public schools. I can't find half these countries on a map, or at least I couldn't when I started this project. We decided way back when, if we were going to do this project, we were going to rely on data. Because two parochial Americans who can barely f locate a country on a map are never going to learn enough about the world to do any subjective evaluation of it. So it's 100% data driven, which is nice because it means our subjective views about Congo or our subjective views about Zimbabwe are not, are not infecting the product. It's also a bit of a handcuff because it means I can't rate North Korea. Now, I don't think anybody here would probably complain if I just threw North Korea in at the bottom and made a number up, you know, 1.5, 1.0, I don't know. No one would probably complain about that, but I would be uncomfortable with that because in the absence of actual data, uh, we, we didn't want to superimpose our views over, over top of the data that we had. So it's a, it's a really a rigorous, it's a really a, we, we put ourselves at sort of a straitjacket with, with respect to the data requirements. So Venezuela is the, in, in a sense, is the, the best country, the worst country, but only the best, you have to be, so, you have to be at least somewhat good to get on the index because uh, you have to have at least data collection uh, abilities. Um, <clears throat> let me show you a map. This is a little hard to read. Every year we do a different cover of the, of the book and on the, on the cover of the book, there's a, uh, a map like this and it's color coded with the red, yellow, green, and, and blue color coding, just like the, the, the bar chart a moment ago. 
Uh, and some years, the colors they choose at the Fraser Institute, our publisher, are a little bit easier to see on these screens. And this is one of those years where it's a little bit not so easy. That kind of pukey green color in the background is not so kind on these, these projectors. But um, so if you look, you can see, well, who are the blue? Ah, United States, Canada, you know, Spain, United Kingdom, Ireland, Germany. Uh, wait, Norway, blue, Sweden, green, Finland, green, Denmark, blue. So one of the things we, we, I think we've learned, and maybe you knew this before, but now we have a little bit better basis for our, for our understanding, is the Northern European so, social welfare, democ uh, you know, social de democratic countries are in fact, have a lot of economic freedom. They are all in the top 25% or maybe just, just, just outside of that in the case of Sweden. Um, and most of Europe is in fact very market. I mean, think about what's it like to live in Stockholm? It's, private cars and private businesses and prices of products are unregulated. They export freely, Volvos all around the world. This is a market economy. This is not a socialist economy. Uh, and, you know, they have high taxes and that brings them down on the index. That's, not, that's why they're not as high as say Hong Kong or Singapore or the US even, but uh, they're, they're, they're market economies. If you wanna see the socialist economies, you go to, uh, well, you go to Argentina or Brazil uh, where the government is infecting every aspect of business you go to large parts of the continent of Africa and you'll see that's actual operating socials and we have governments running enterprises of course Venezuela is the current standard bearer there um, so so the index is is it allows us to I think unlearn some of the things we may may thought we knew some people think socialism is, is Sweden I'm gonna say no socialism is is Venezuela um, so that's that's kind of cool uh, the other thing I really like um, I don't know how much history here but y'all do here, but the, the, the Soviet Union is a, a favorite of mine. I grew up in the Cold War era, and when I was your age, I watched the Soviet Union fall apart, which is, I think is one of the greatest things ever happened in the last several hundred years. Um, and we started doing this index right at the same time as the Soviet Union was falling apart. It took us a few years to get their numbers in, but I've been able with the index to track how the different parts and pieces of the old Soviet Union in the, in the Eastern Bloc, how those bits and pieces have gone, how, what they've done since then. And as I mentioned, some of them like Georgia here, this is Georgia and Armenia, they've, they've run pretty headlong towards markets. Georgia now ranking sixth. This is also true of the Baltics, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are all blue. These are Soviet republics 27 or eight years ago, and today they're, they're in the top 25%. Um, getting in case of Georgia, getting a number that's comparable to that of the United States. Um, that's an impressive thing. So we've, we've witnessed this huge move for, in these countries from Soviet communism to Marxism, to, to capitalism of some sort or another. And that's, the numbers are tracking that. Of course, it hasn't happened everywhere. Uh, this is Ukraine and Belarus. I just got Belarus this year. I, they, were, they were like North Korea. I just got the numbers for Belarus this year. I'm very happy because it's a big country, and it was very embarrassing to have this big gray blob in the middle of Europe. Anyway, Belarus and Ukraine are both red. What did they do after the Soviet Union fell apart? They changed the letterhead on the country, and that was it, you know, same guys pretty much ran things. It's, it's, it's not, they don't have concentration camps, so that's a plus, but it's not, these countries are not uh, liberalizing much economically or otherwise for that matter. Um, Russia's just plodding along, but other parts like the, this is Kyrgyzstan, and, um, Kazakhstan and Mongolia, they've, they've done a reasonable job of, of liberalizing. So watching the little bits of the Soviet Union, some of them ru rushed towards markets, some of them kind of limped towards markets like Kazakhstan, and some just sort of said, we're good, we're going to just be bad like we always have been. Ukraine's working on that right now. As far as I can tell, Belarus is, is there's no interest in Belarus uh, in liberalism. I've met some Belarus liberals and they're, 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 they're they got tough lives. The other thing I like to look at, mentioned here, the map up is Africa. Africa is looks pretty bad, looks pretty bleak. A lot of the lowest rated countries are African countries. Um, this is a little bit deceiving because this map is always relative. By design, 25% of the countries every year we do this map will be colored red. What you don't see with this map is that the numbers, the actual ratings, those zero to 10 scores, for African countries have been getting much better. Now to be sure, they're still predominantly in the bottom quarter, or maybe the second to the bottom, the, the yellow quarter, um, but they've been getting much better. Where they used to be threes and fours, now they're fours and fives. So the index itself has come up from the bottom. 
And this has been, uh, uh, in, so the average of the world is getting better, but largely it's getting better because the bottom is, is moving up. There's been a lot of liberalization in Africa, a lot of reductions in tariffs, a lot of improvements in uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. Uh, even, even Zimbabwe has, no longer has hyperinflation. I don't think there's any hyperinflation in the world outside of Venezuela today. Uh, so the monetary systems in Africa have stabilized. Um, it's not easy to see, but Rwanda, which was, of course, um, had its troubles in the 90s, uh, Rwanda is blue and is the highest rated African country. So uh, it's just in the 25th percentile, it's just, or 75th percentile, it's just in the top there. So, so Africa's getting a lot better. It's still kind of, relatively speaking, at the bottom, but there's been a lot of improvement. I'm relatively bullish about Africa. I'm not, I'm not giving investment advice, though. Uh, but I'm relatively bullish about Africa, particularly Anglophone Africa. If you look at Botswana, Zambia, uh, Kenya, um, to a certain extent Tanzania, but in Rwanda, uh, Uganda, not too bad. These, the, those are the countries I, that I think are really on the verge, perhaps, of of, of having a growth spurt not unlike what we saw in South and Southeast Asia um, the last 25 years. Again, that's not exactly investment advice, but it's, it's, I think there's some good stuff going on. Our hemisphere has been pretty quiet. Most of these relative rankings are about the same, a little bit of improvement in Central America, um, even, even Nicaragua. I think it is, is Ortega still running that show down there? Uh, I think there's, Nicaragua is still nominally socialist, but it's like fake socialism there. So. Daniel Ortega wears fatigues and talks about the great Satan of America, and then he puts on a Brooks Brothers suit and he goes to New York and tries to drum up more venture capital for open more factories in, in, in Nicaragua. So, uh, so we've actually got Nicaragua scoring re relatively good now even. Um, Panama and Costa Rica are in blue. Um, so, but, mo but pretty stable here. Uh, these countries have not really changed much color uh, uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. The Western Hemisphere uh, the ones that were more liberal are still more liberal. The ones that, you know, there's not a lot of change, whereas in Africa and, and Europe, and again, the Soviet Union, you're seeing all these changes over time. And that's, 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 uh, that's interesting. Um, let, me get, let me sort of segue towards uh, the punchline here. Who was right, Marx or, or Smith? Well, now that we have an index of economic freedom, um, I think it's fair to say that the countries that are blue are more like what Adam Smith wanted. The countries that are red are less like Adam Smith wanted. And it turns out, not surprisingly, I think, that the countries that have a more Adam Smithian-like system are in fact richer. That's what, what Adam Smith would have projected in the wealth of the nation. This is GDP per capita, measured in purchasing power parity terms. The, it's the best crude, but it's the best measure we have of standard of living across countries. So the average blue country on that map has an income of about $40,000 per person, and the average uh, red is about $6,000, less than $6,000 per person. Um, this picture probably would not have surprised Karl Marx. Karl Marx did understand that capitalism was a productive force, right? It made a lot, it produced a lot of stuff. The great Marxian yeah but was that, oh yeah, but it all goes to the rich, right? So uh, this is the uh, World Bank's data. You can do this any way you want. And you can do this with Gini coefficients if you'd like, but you get the same picture. I, I like to use the bottom, the, t the income share being earned by the bottom 10% for this graph. So this is, you take all the people in the world, ignore the top 90%, just look at the bottom 10% and ask what share of the income, what share of the money earned in that country does the bottom 10th get? And it's not very much. There's a lot of income inequality in the world. Uh, more, more income inequality than I'm comfortable with, and I suspect more income inequality than many of you are comfortable with. But it also turns out that that inequality, whether you're in a red, yellow, green, or blue country, is about the same across the board. If you do this with a, like an XY, a, a scattergram, it looks like a shotgun blast of dots. There is no pattern. It turns out that there's inequality in economically free countries, like Hong Kong, and there's, econo there's inequality in e economically unfree countries, like Venezuela. And there is no general pattern. This has been uh, studied with more sophisticated econometrics. I know I might have some econometricians in the room. Uh, the handful of papers that have looked at inequality and, and economic freedom, basically some s a couple say economic freedom causes more inequality, a couple say it causes less inequality, a couple say the number is zero. The number is probably about zero. That is to say there's no relationship between the level of economic freedom as we measure it 
and the degree of income inequality around the world. Um, so I don't really know what causes income inequality. I wish I did. Um, but I'm pretty sure that economic freedom, or lack thereof even, is not really the culprit. Um, and that's something I don't think my Marxist friends from Ohio University would have, would have, would have expected to see. Um, this is my favorite because uh, I'm a data guy and I deal with a lot of sketchy data, I have to admit. I deal with, you know, tax rates for Congo and things. I like life expectancy data. Life expectancy data are available for all countries in the world. And really all you need is birth and death records to calculate life expectancy. And birth and death records, even in the sort of poorest places on earth, births and deaths are well, reasonably well recorded. So demographers are able to, with, reasonable, with a fairly high degree of accuracy, measure life expectancy. So the high, it's high quality data is what I'm getting at. And uh, it turns out that the countries that are blue on that map have an average life expectancy from birth of about 80. Um, the US brings that average down just a tiny bit. But the average in the red is about 64. That's gone up quite a bit, but it's still about a 16 or 15 year difference. And you know, if you live to be 80, you're gonna live to see your grandkids grow up and maybe see your grandkids grow up and have grandkids of their own, see your own grandkids. If you die when you're 64 years old, you'll see your grandkids. That's about the end of it. You won't see your grandkids grow up probably. And you, you have almost no chance of seeing your great grandchildren. And I'm not a grandparent yet. My daughter's uh, 24 or so, and I'm really, I'm ready. Don't tell her that. But, um, um, but I'm told by my grandparents, uh, one of whom is still alive, that uh, being a grandparent is one of great, life's great tr pleasures, one of life's great treasures. And I look at this graph and I, I say, you know, I really want a chance to be a grandparent. And I would like to be a great grandparent if I, if I could. And that means I want to, my best shot of that's going to be one of those blue countries, not one of those uh, green, yellow, or red countries. Uh, the good news is that this gap has closed quite a bit, so that's good news. Um, infant mortality, this goes the other way because infant mortality is bad. Okay, so this is deaths per uh, uh, thousand um, births. Uh, it's about six in, in the blue countries. The U.S. brings that average uh, up a little bit because I think we're at nine, I think, in the United States, if I remember right. But again, compared to the red countries where it's 42 um, infants dying per thousand births, so not a close call. This is poverty rates uh, measured by the, uh, by the official International World Bank standard. Uh, moderate poverty, which is, I think is the, the bar on the left, is uh, $1 and, excuse me, is $3.20 a day. Um, extreme poverty is, is, is earning less than $1.90 a day. <laughs> So this is the share of the population that are below these income thresholds. Um, 30 to 50 percent in the red countries, one to four percent in the blue countries. So again, as expected, uh, the blue, the more economically free countries have done a much better job of dealing with poverty. It's not perfect yet, of course. And then uh, this is kind of gets at the um, Singapore question. It's also a question that I think PPE students might be interested in. Um, is there a trade-off? between economic liberalism, economic freedom, and political freedom. We saw Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, again, especially Singapore, which is an authoritarian regime. I mean, it's not Nazi Germany in Singapore, but it's an authoritarian regime. Uh, and one, one of the things that people are, are saying now, I sometimes hear, is that, hey, we should be like Singapore. We should have an authoritarian, strong-arm government and, and free markets. Um, well. As a matter of correlation, those two don't go together. This is the World Bank, this is the, excuse me, the Freedom House data on political rights and civil liberties. They are almost the same number, so that's why they, they don't look that different. Uh, their index is backwards, so that in their index, a lower score is better. So I reverse the, the order just to make it look right. So the, the 1.9, 1.98 on the blue, that means they've got better political rights and better civil liberties. The good news is, if you look across the whole planet, there does not appear to be any necessity anyway that you trade off economic freedom for political freedom. You don't have, if you want more economic freedom, that doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your political rights or your civil liberties. This is good news. Most countries have both. Most countries that are, that are good on economics also have good political and economic liberalism. I think Singapore is an outlier and we should not hold it up as, a, as, a, as an example. Um, Chile, of course, historically is the, is the and I know, Professor Munger knows a lot more about Chile than I'll ever know. Uh, Chile, of course, the other country, which uh, has this dark spot on it. It liberalized its economy whilst it was an authoritarian dictatorship. So 
uh, with a lot of really bad things happening in the midst of that. So uh, those are outliers, though. The, the greatest examples of economic liberalization have actually occurred in democracies and in, in countries that are more, more politically liberal. So um, um, this is a research question, though, that I think is worth, once we have the Economic Freedom Index in our hands, we can then begin to ask these questions. What's the relationship between economic freedom on the one hand and political liberalism on the other hand? Do they go together? Are they in conflict? If they're in conflict, how are they in conflict? These are the kinds of research questions that we hope this index uh, engenders with uh, students. Um, I, and this is the last graph. <laughs> and I only put it in because people keep asking me to put it in. Uh, you've seen these happiness indexes. Now, I do a freedom index. Now, I think that's about as crazy as you should go. I have no idea what happiness index are trying to measure. I'm feeling, I'm like at 12 right now myself. Um, but, you know, in about an hour when I get my first drink, I'll be like a 99 in, in the happiness index. Uh, so I don't know what happiness indexes even mean, but there is a happiness index. The UN has a happiness index, there are other ones. And uh, I am happy to report uh, that freer economically free countries report themselves, people in those countries report themselves to be more, it's actually a life satisfaction. It's how satisfied are you with your life. It's usually just a survey. And they report their life, themselves to be more satisfied with their lives. I don't even know what this means, but people keep asking me about it because the, these happiness indexes have gotten quite popular. I think there's a journal of happiness studies now or something you can get published in. Um, so last and not least, this is a plug for the product. Um, this URL is, is, a, is a stupid name, freetheworld.com. I don't know who came up with that. It actually redirects you to the, the, the proper website, which is run by the Fraser Institute. Fraser Institute is a Canadian think tank, and they've been publishing our product every year since 1996. Um, and if you go to that product, you'll see this, this picture right here. It's a map just like the one I showed you. You can actually scroll, I think somewhere around here, you can scroll backwards and see the map, the colors of the maps back in time. It's, it's not fully animated, but it's a reasonably nice thing. You, if you want to look at the data set, if you want that spreadsheet I mentioned, you can download the entire spreadsheet, all the numbers for all the countries, all the way back to 1970. There is a companion product on there. Um, called the Economic Freedom of North America that might interest you as well. And this is, as it sounds, it's a index, just like our index, but it measures at the subnational level uh, for the 50 United States, I think nine Canadian provinces, and I think about 20 Mexican states. Um, the little bit of apples and oranges, it's hard to compare Idaho with, um, uh, with Nuevo Leon, uh, but because of the structural difference between the two countries, but we have this index here. It's actually authored primarily by my, my colleague in the O'Neill Center at SMU, Dean Stanzel. So uh, I think uh, if I look, it looks like North Carolina is a green, which is the same, I think they use five colors there, so the green is sort of the second quartile. Not, 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 not great, not like Texas. Texas is the best, uh, but, but sort of second grade. Okay. So if you're interested in these economic freedom indexes, there are other freedom indexes out there at different levels. There are actually, uh, and the website I think has a, links to most of them, there are indexes for like Brazilian states and Italian states and the German Bundes, whatever they call them in Germany. Uh, uh, I think there's even a, a, a Chinese provincial uh, index that's been done. I know there's, I know there's one been done. I think, the, I think the link is there too. So if you're interested in these, these economic freedom variations within countries, um, there, are, there are some products out there for selected countries that you can, can investigate.